Dear friends, the entire world is passing for a very difficult phase, especially so in India. Two days back, we emerged the world leader in COVID infection. Our governments are clueless. There is a severe shortage of essentials, oxygen, hospital beds, medicines, crematoriums, and graveyards. Even our general awareness to the dangers is limited. We are surrounded by a barrage of lies and half truths. Humanity is paying a heavy toll for its past acts. It is not that a pandemic has descended on us for the first time. It is just that we were not prepared. But then there is no need to be pessimistic about it. We will surmount this as we did in the past. Not once, but many a times. History has a lesson for us. We have been through this before, and it will be past us once again. It is a tool of awareness and knowledge which has helped us before. Gaining knowledge would help us again. History teaches us that humanity survives all calamities but stumbles when we stand divided. Whenever we have one against the other on the basis of religion or caste, race or color of our skin, we have not only stumbled but fallen. Fascism, racism, Nazism, and now Hindutva has taken more lives than any pandemic. Remember 1992 or 2002 or Nelly before all that? Have we forgotten 1984? We bleed more when we stand by. So let us learn our lesson. Be positive and fight the common virus just as we fight the COVID virus. And it is to fight these social viruses of ignorance, caste, and religious divisions that we are holding these lecture series. These talks and lectures are our shield against such viruses which have taken a pandemic form and are dividing us. Since October, we have been administering small doses of sanity to inoculate you from the myths which are being spun on a daily basis to divide us and arraign one brother against the other. Today, continuing the series, we have another very potent scholar the celebrated author of the laws of Hindustan, Dr. Bangan Ahmad, is a historian of South Asia and the littoral Western Indian Ocean world from 1000 to 1800. His areas of specialization include intellectual history in South and Southeast Asia, critical philosophy of history colonial and anti-colonial thought. He has extensive background in the digital history, in the history of archives, in the global south, and the problems of access and control of digitized materials. He is one of the lead faculty in two major international research projects, before being decolonization and the disciplines and the university, which he took uh, between 2019 and 2023, which was funded by the Belong, which is funded by the Belong Foundation. And the second is Muslims in India, 2020 to 23, it is also learning, it is funded by Bruce Foundation. Earlier, he published two books, the first being Where the Wild Frontiers Are. Pakistan and the American Imagination, which was published in 2011. Second work was a book of conquest, the Chakslama 
and Muslim origins in South Asia, published by Harvard University Press in 2016. This work is on the intellectual life of an early 13th century Persian history, Dutch Lama, also known as Patanamaya Sindh. The book delves into how Muslim polities instead address several differences, created new ethics of rule, and articulated a political theory of power in the 13th century Indian Persian world. This recent and most celebrated book. The Loss of Hindustan, Invention of India, was published in 2020, again by the Harvard University Press. It is a history of the historians of the subcontinent from the 10th to the early 20th century. The book is a concept history of Hindustan, focusing specifically on the work of the 17th century Deccan historian Farishta. It argues from a decolonized philosophy of history the subcontinent. This book has generated much interest as well as debate. In fact, the loss of Hindustan is a masterful journey into many histories of the subcontinent. It is about a history written by powerful colonizers, which went and to uh, on to define it to the outsider and later became the worldview of the inhabitants themselves. It is about reading history to see the present clearly and then examine the future. Anand's work is of traversing the history of histories in India over the ages and explain how it served as a precursor of people's evaluation of themselves. The loss of Hindustan boldly tackles the question of present day prejudices and majoritarian communities of continent, whether Hindutva or Sunni Muslim, and what it can owe to how history has been crafted for the past two centuries. Today, Dr. Manna Ahmad is here with us to talk on Firshtas Tariq and its renditions. Without further ado, let us hear what Manna has to tell us. Over to you, Dr. Manna. Um, thank you. Thank you, Professor Rizavi. Thank you so much for this great honor to um, Give me this invitation and uh, to invite me to this uh, project of Ganga Jamni um, scholarship uh, that is intended to do some reflection on the ways in which we find ourselves in the present, as you say. I want to just start by saying that my thoughts uh, and prayers are with all of my friends in Delhi, in Kolkata, in Lahore, who are. Um, suffering from a terrible calamity brought by not just the disease, but also the ways in which our political organizations have treated this disease. Um, and we saw this in New York last year, and now I'm seeing on Twitter just harrowing images. I'm seeing, I'm hearing from friends who are um, battling this disease, and I'm, I'm I'm so sorry that this is where we are in 2021. Um, and and uh, <laughs> I don't know how to how to how to kind of um, talk about uh, perhaps academic things, uh, but I appreciate as as uh, Professor Rezavi says, that there is a uh, intellectual as well as a moral grounds on which we ought to, think about the other viruses that are responsible, not just the virus of um, SARS-CoV-2 um, mutation, COVID-19, but also the ways in which totalitarianism, majoritarianism um, are part of the social fabric and are infecting our daily lives. So um, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, 
my book, um, the the loss of Hindustan, the invention of India, um, and I was asked to reflect a little bit on uh, Farishta's Tarikh that uh, is at the heart of this book. Uh, Farishta uh, Muhammad Qasim Farishta um, is a historian who wrote his uh, text in the early parts of the 17th century. Um, and this is a text that, um, a history that becomes incredibly important uh, for Europe. It becomes incredibly important for um, the subcontinent and it becomes incredibly important for the project that I detail in my book, which is the project of history writing itself. And um, before I kind of talk a little bit about the renditions of Farishta, um, by renditions, I mean various translations or various ways in which the, the text is used. Um, I want to say a little bit about, um, I want to start by, by saying a little bit about this idea of history writing itself. And one of the things that I think is incredibly important for us to keep in mind that history, um, the writing of history, the writing of the past, the writing of the colonized past by the colonizer is one of the most central instrument for colonization. And this is uh, demonstrable as early as um, the conquest of uh, Mexico, uh, Mexico City's foundation is both uh, Cortez's um, physical conquest and destruction, but also his attempt to immediately conceive of a history writing project for those that he has decimated. Um, we see this in the Portuguese examples uh, as well, immediately this, this out, outlining of historical writing about Indies. And so history as a colonizing tool means how is it that as European colonization is beginning um, to militarily uh, dominate a space, the peoples that are being enslaved or transported or eliminated, um, those people themselves become subjects of history writing. So they go from actors and agents to subjects. And once they go from actors and agents to subjects, they also disappear from their own past and their past thus becomes an object of study. And this, uh, of course, is an, not an argument that I need to detail in too much details because it's been made by so many great scholars. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, point out one thing that I think is important for us here which is just as history becomes a tool for colonization, anti-colonial thought has to deal with the work of history. And so you can think of uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru uh, writing the letters of history to young Indira Gandhi, published later, Glimpses from World History. Um, you can also think of his um, the more known discovery of India. You can think of um, a number of uh, scholars in the 1910s and 20s and 30s who are writing not only history, but about history, who are thinking about history as a subject or historiography as a subject. And in this, scholars like Kay Dizami, um, um, Professor uh, Muhammad Habib, and others who have to both produce a, a set of historical knowledge, but also contest the colonial uh, kind of archive of history writing itself. Um, in an earlier work, I, I talked about how figures like Shibli Nomani, Abdul Halim Sharar are struggling with this question of history, right? So at the one end, you can, you can write a historical norma, romance, you can write uh, Malik Virginia, you can write, um, uh, uh, you know, something that is um, explaining history in, to a broader audience. Uh, but at the same time, you also have a great, I think, burden to prove that what you're doing is historically sound. And that means footnotes. It means 
archive visits that are documented. It means citations. It means reading people like, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Thomas Carlyle or Edward Gibbons or other historians who are writing, Winston Smith, um, translating their words or summarizing their thoughts. Um, and we see this not not only in in that generation of Sharer, Shibli, Zakaullah, etc., but even later. Um, you know, how do you actually um, resist or participate in the act of history writing through the discourse that that history um, uh, through the kind of ways in which history has to be organized. We call this philosophy of history mostly because philosophy of history is a theory for why history happens that emerges in the mid to late um, 18th century Europe and that kind of comes to its fruition, theoretically speaking, in the early to mid parts of the 19th century. And that project is taken up seriously uh, in the 1910s and 20s and after the Second World War. Uh, in the in the wake of the Holocaust, um, these moments in Europe, uh, these moments of uh, whether it's in the um, 17, 1780s, uh, 1820s, uh, 1920s, or uh, 1940s, are when something called the philosophy of history is said to have developed. And we have these names in that uh, constellation. We know, uh, for example, Gibbon's work. We know Voltaire. We know Kant. We know Herder. We know Hegel. Uh, we know Schlegel, um, and then later on, um, figures um, like the Annal schools, uh, uh, and and then uh, of course the the post structuralist. Now, within this kind of intellectual history story that that's both European, very specifically Northern European, it's a story of Germany, France, and England, really. But also it's universal because it's what history is, how we think history act to has to kind of be understood what it's what it does mean to be objective in history or what does it mean to be um, uh, what is how do we think about cause and effect? What is the dialectic? What is the materialism? Um, how do we think about Marx and Marx's reading of history under a new Hegelian framework? All of these things are a, in one sense very particular. They're particular to individuals. Um, they're particular to regions, they're particular to language, um, but at the same time, they're also universal. There's something that organizes thought in, in the African continent, organizes thought in the subcontinent, organizes thought in Latin America and the colonized worlds in general, where intellectuals have to contend with both the universality of it and the provinciality. And within this, we have had from South Asia a number of incredibly important critiques, both by figures like Partha Chatterjee, Romila Topper, um, um, you know, most recently Sanjay Subramaniam, David Shulman, and Arana Rao had an amazingly important book, Textures of Time, um, and, and, a, and a range of other figures, even more recently, Pratma Banerjee, uh, et cetera, who are, who are kind of um, thinking of what this relationship between the so-called universal and the so-called uh, uh, provincial is. My story uh, basically fits in the origins of this, uh, this dichotomy, which is the making of the universal. And in the making of the universal is Farishta, is this history that is written in the early part of 17th century. Um, and that um, a, a gentleman named Alexander Dow who is part of the Bengal infantry, who is someone um, who begins his career in the public self, in the public realm. Um, he begins his career by, by kind of, you know, translating a uh, rendering from Persian into uh, English and from Sanskrit into English different texts. So he, he translates something called tales of Inayatullah of Delhi, which are um, uh, in the mode of uh, Saadi Shirazi, etc. Um, and then he basically claims that um, there's in his in his pursuit of thinking about uh, this history, he as he's as he's kind of reading about it, he asks for a, a piece of history that could tell the story of Hindustan. And his teachers gave him the work of Muhammad Qasim Farishta, who he thinks or he tells his readers.
is someone who belongs to Delhi and is writing in the Delhi in the Mughal court. Um, and this authentic, minute and authentic, as, our, as he calls it, uh, Dao calls it, um, history is something that he then takes back with him to London, um, begins to render it into English, uh, dedicates that first rendering in 1768 to the, the king, King George, um, and says that, you know, what's important about this, uh, uh, sir, this history of India, is that this is a story of a colony that suffers under despotism. And even as it suffers under despotism, this colony, the reading this history of this colony, allows your liberal subjects to make sure that they know that their king is just and great. And so what this rendering, this first rendering of 1768 is doing is, is an incredible act of doubling time. It is taking the the common time, the time in which the colony and the colon and the metropole exist, in which Bengal and London exist, and it's fracturing it and putting the subcontinent, putting Hindustan in a despotic time, in a tyrannical time, and the metropole in a liberal time. And so suddenly, as you're reading this history, written 150 years before the British uh, are um, uh, before Dao is translating it. So it's literally a history from a 150 years ago, but is there you're reading it as, as if it is telling you a story of the here and the now, of the time of 1768. And you do this as a writer by basically adding to the text certain new details, okay? You're adding to the text, what, what, what he adds to the text are these dissertations, uh, which we would call appendixes. And the first one in 1768, uh, he calls a dissertation concerning the religion and philosophy of the Brahmins. And the second one, a dissertation on the uh, conditioning, uh, on, the, on the history of the Mughal Empire from its decline in the reign of Muhammad Shah. To the present time, right? So, so is history of Hindustan from the 17th century is then surrounded by these two texts, and then kind of presented as a story of the present of of the colonial present. What in this rendering, and then 1768, this text is immediately translated into German. It's immediately translated into French. Uh, Dow's very good friend David Hume sends a copy to Voltaire, um, uh, sorry, and to Kant. Um, Kant uses it for his idea of universal history. Um, it's a text that has um, uh, immediate uh, kind of uh, resolutions in the kind of philosophy of history conversation that I mentioned earlier. What about the text itself, right? So after 1768, he follows up with um, a second volume or uh, the first 1768 rendition is in two volumes, then third volume is in 1772. Um, and that volume, uh, The History of Hindustan, um, again, titled as Farishtas, uh, is actually about um, from the death of Akbar to the complete settlement of the empire under Aurangzeb. So time moving past Farishtas text. And to this volume, he adds a dissertation on the origins and nature of the um, uh, despotism in Hindustan, as well as an inquiry into the state of Bengal with a plan for restoring that kingdom to its former prosperity and splendor. And this last bit is something that becomes incredibly important for permanent settlement as uh, Ranajit Guha's uh, book on the permanent settlement describes using this exact text. So what's happening that a Persian history is being taken up. It's being, it's a history of Hindustan. And then it's being translated. We haven't spoken about what being translated or not, but it's being surrounded by these, by these apparatus um, to present uh, its, its role. Now, what's happening inside the text is that while 
the history that Farishta wrote is a history that is a of a geography that we could now recognize from Kabul to Bengal, from the Himalayas to the Lanka, um, and it and a time that we would now say is quite unique because it's not um, time of um, um, you know what we would call Abrahamic descent. So it's not the creation of the world by God and and all of the prophets. Um, all the way to uh, to a ruler, and it's not the story of tabakat. It's not the story of generations of kings of a polity. What Farista is doing is something very unique, very important. Uh, what he's doing is giving a map of the subcontinent divided by regions. He begins with um, kind of Lahore, Delhi, Deccan, Gujarat. Malwa, Handesh, Bengal, Multan, Sin, Kashmir, Malabar, and then um, kind of a characteristics of Hindustan as a whole. So in each of these uh, spaces, in each of these spaces that he, he presents as both geographies, as in regions, but also really cities, and, and then he, he goes on to tell you who their rulers are and what their peoples are and so on and so forth. So none of that is really what happens in the translation, in the rendition. What, what, um, what Tao is only basically uh, interested in is, is, is the story of uh, Lahore, it's the story of Delhi, it's the story of Bengal. Um, and those are the only bits that are, are, are um, kind of um, rendered into English. And also... He's interested in kind of um, adding to that story other histories that he's also collecting. So it's not really a one-to-one -one translation, but rather it's a taking the concepts of a authentic, minute history, using it as a scaffolding to write a basically a justification for permanent settlement, a elucidation of Oriental despotism, an idea of Muslims as foreigners, Muslims as tyrants, and a Hindu population that is uh, quietist and um, suffering. Um, after um, this, this particular rendition, which as I mentioned, becomes incredibly important for people, um, there is a renewed effort to think about how to tell this story uh, from a more um, kind of detailed perspective, uh, as in how to translate more of Farishta than has been translated um, by Dao. And for that, we what, 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 what happens is that, again, part of the folks who are working in the Bengal infantry under uh, Warren Hastings, um, they, uh, the next rendition is done by Jonathan Scott, who is one of the uh, Persian teachers uh, of uh, Hastings, but is also someone who is involved in the setting up of Asiatic society in Bengal. Um, and what the, uh, you know, what, what Jonathan Scott is interested in is actually Deccan. Uh, because that's where the Marathi wars are happening. And so he's less interested in the Lahore parts of Farishta, and he's more interested in the Deccan parts of Farishta. And so what he does, uh, Jonathan Scott does, um, is that he then kind of turns to those portions of Farishtas that um, he calls the first Muhammadan conquests, history of Deccan, right? So Farishta, again, from Hindustan, now becomes uh, Deccan and then with Deccan, uh, Bengal. So this is 1794. Um, and again, in this, in this particular operation, um, Aurangzeb is incredibly important. Again, Aurangzeb is not part of Farishta at all, but um, the Persian Farishta. But for Jonathan Scott, Aurangzeb, the story of Aurangzeb's operations in the Deccan are incredibly important for the military project that is happening. Um, and so Jonathan Scott, 1794 uh, rendering, um, is published in the Asiatic Society. Um, it's something that uh, becomes really important uh, for the project of figuring out 
what is the um, kind of a bibliography for the, the history of Muhammad in India, as it was, as it is called. Um, the next important uh, rendering that I want to talk to you about, tell you about, is done by uh, General John Briggs. Uh, John Briggs is uh, basically, again, is involved in the Marathi campaigns. He's uh, basically uh, part of the Bombay, in the creation and establishment of Bombay presidency. Um, Briggs um, travels across the Deccan and Gujarat, uh, Maharashtra area uh, with two munshis that he uh, helps make maps, both for the military campaign, but also for his translation of Farishta. And so he publishes then four volumes. Uh, what he titles is a history of the rise of the Muhammadan power in India till the year 1612, which is uh, Farishta's date, uh, translated from the original Persian of Muhammad Qasim Farishta. Uh, Briggs is part of the Madras army. He is, um, he is um, again, incredibly um, invested in this idea of how to... Uh, conquer Hyderabad, how to conquer uh, these spaces, and what would Farista add to this conversation? So uh, what Briggs says, in, and he also dedicates to this translation to the East India Company, uh, what Briggs says that this, this text um, has been incompletely rendered by figures like uh, uh, Dow and Scott. Um, and the thing that he thinks is the most key thing for Farishta is the geography. It's actually the details of the land, the towns, who belongs where, what are their roots, what are their origins, who, what la names they have. So it's basically a mapping project. Um, and this mapping project he undertakes in a, in a sense to kind of complete this. Uh, so uh, Briggs's translation though is, is takes up the whole text um, is actually, when you look at it has very few, it's, it's basically a lines of translation with very long footnotes. And the footnotes are incredibly important because it's in the footnotes that he's resolving place names. He's resolving um, geographic details. Um, and, and again, if we think about the beginning of the trigonomatic survey, if when we think about the colonization of much of the subcontinent that's, that's happening, you can think of how this, this turning of Farishta into a geography of conquest under a rendition is so important. And that's what's happened um, in Briggs' thing. So the, the, the next one I want to talk to you about is, is our... our, our aspects of Farishta's rendering that are not anymore about simply using a, bits of it for translation or framework of, for, for despotism or framework for military uh, domination, but something like a synthetic idea of what an archive for history writing must look like for the project of writing a history of Hindustan. Muslim, Muhammad in India, as by now, we, we the British Indians are, British India is divided into this time, right? Muhammad in India, ancient India, Muhammad in India, um, the Dark Ages, and then the arrival of the liberal British under uh, Mills, James Mills formulation. So in this project, um, um, there are two names that I think are incredibly important for us, uh, Elphinstone, uh, Montserrat Elphinstone, who has a history of India that uh, comes out in 1841. Um, and, but also, I think more importantly, um, uh, H.M. Eliot, uh, Henry Myers Eliot, whose bibliographic, bibliographic index uh, to the historians of Muhammad in India is published in, um, is, is compiled between 1847 and 50. Now, Eliot is someone who's in the foreign office, who's negotiating the surrender of the Sikh uh, empire, who's responsible for the Kohenur, for example, going to, uh, going to the queen. Um, and he's someone who is invested in building this archive, building this idea for history writing, right? So he's not simply writing a history. He writes a, 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 a we can call it a monograph on Arabs and Sindh. He's very interested in the kind of origin story of Islam.
Uh, but what he wants is, is he wants to create an archive. He wants to create a, here are the 280 titles, he says, that you need in order to write the history of Muslim Muhammad in India. These titles, the first one among them is Farishta. Farishta for him is the index from which he can take the historians that he needs to isolate, identify, create an infrastructure for acquisition. So he sends this pamphlet with the ledger drawing. Uh, he sends it to all the political agents scattered around um, uh, around the subcontinent. And he says, here's a list of manuscripts I want. Here's a list that you need to prepare this list in this order. Um, you, you know, you to fill out a ledger form in this ledger. So what's the, who's the author, how many pages, how many waraks, uh, what are the first four lines? Uh, what is the summary of the project, uh, the, the text? And, you know, uh, do you have a complete copy or an incomplete copy? Um, and then shipping that to, to, to him. Um, this project ends up in what we know, the complete history of Muhammad in India in 12 volumes which also contains a rendition of Farishta, selections from Farishta, um, alongside selections from, um, I, like I mentioned, about 230 other texts, 30 other Persian histories. Now, within this, we would call it the third phase of Farishta's rendering, uh, 1850s, 1840s and 50s, um, is Eliot's colleague, uh, someone he hires, to go to Avad um, Aloy Sprenger. Sprenger is the principal of Delhi College um, and his catalog of the Arabic, Persian and Hindustani manuscripts of the libraries of King of Avad is, he publishes it in 1854. Now Sprenger is someone who is, is, is basically creating the, the is, uh, is basically acquiring the manuscripts collecting them, not only from Avad and, and Rampur, but, but also Damascus and, and, um, and uh, Cairo. And all of the Sprenger collection is now in Berlin, where he sells it to the Berlin uh, Staatsbibliothek. Um, and so what, um, what Elliot um, is basically asking Sprenger to do is to collect those histories that he has identified from Farishta. Sprenger then uh, publishes the manuscript collections uh, after Eliot's death. It's Sprenger who goes through Eliot's um, holdings and publishes a list of manuscript Eliot in private collection of Eliot, which are now in British Library. So this is kind of the amassment of the accumulation phase of Farishta's rendering. Farishta is through all of these phases, right? He's in the broken up, spliced up infrastructure phase of Dao, uh, and Jonathan Scott, he's in the military campaigning geographies phase of Briggs. Um, he's now in the Elphinstone and Elliot and Sprenger accumulation phase where the text is being used in order to collect an archive, to create an archive. And the last rendition of Furishta that I want to bring to your attention is what happens um, after 1857, after the Elliot project. Um, after uh, the the uprising um, by 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 um, by anti-colonial figures that are now known as sepoys, um, and this is a project of history writing taken up by the likes of um, Shibli Nomani, but really Zakaullah that I want to mention at the end. Zakaullah writes a Tariqa Hindustan, um, which is basically rewrites it between 1897 and 1910 and 10 and 14 volumes. It's a massive project. Um, it is meant in fact to kind of answer Eliot's project and all of Zakaullah's beginning is basically a summary of Eliot's uh, bibliographic index uh, argument with a response, almost line by line response. It's very difficult to read in the, in the lithograph because you don't know where he's quoting Eliot and where he's responding almost uh, in verbatim. Um, and which is why a generation of scholars thought that Zakaullah shouldn't be read because he's just summarizing or just reading Eliot and has nothing original to say. And he's a mathematician and et cetera, et cetera. And he was dismissed uh, by, by, by scholars uh, for a long time 
Um, I try to make a case for us to take Zakaullah seriously. Um, so why is Zakaullah important? Because Zakaullah also is re-rendering Farishta. And Farishta for Zakaullah is not doing the work that Farishta was doing for Dao, Scott, uh, uh, our, our um, Elliot and uh, Elphinstone. Um, but really, he is now providing a kind of um, um, notional identity to Hindustan itself. Uh, so this is the kind of, we can see this as the third avatar, or fourth, sorry, fourth avatar of Farishta. Another rendering. Again, incomplete. Doesn't share the same logic that Farishta has, but is now responding to not just Farishta, but all of these accumulations. Um, and in this sense, I think the the argument that um, that you know the way in which Zakaullah treats Farishta um, is very much about how um, Farishta allows us to write histories of communities. Right, so not geography, but people. So, who are the Hindu rajas in Farishta? Who are the Muslim Muslim rajas in Farishta? So, for for Zakaullah, space becomes inverted to identity as a Muslim or not, which is again the colonial project, right? Um, and and I think that's why the 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 judgment um, by people like Mushirul Hassan and others. Um, is that Zakaullah is basically a colonial writing in a, in a colonial vein and, and, you know, doesn't really need to be read. But I, I, I do think that even there, Zakaullah, though convinced of the colonial project, though writing within that paradigm, has a really interesting um, reading of Farishta itself. And, and that reading is about how to reassemble a geography that got kind of broken up under the earlier rendering of Farishta. Um, and I think there his project of kind of a civilizational answer, right? So so um, Tahzeeb al-Ukhlaq, one of his books, um, uh, Tahzeeb al-Ukhlaq, Arya Hind, Yani Hanud, which is this idea that you can have a civilizational continuity, which we are here thinking about in terms of Ganga Jamni. But this civilizational argument is incredibly important part of why Zakaullah uh, reads Farishta in the way he does. And that also gives to other authors like Malvi Abdul Karim um, and, you know, um, Sheikh Muhammad Iqbal and other people who kind of take up that reading of Farishta uh, or that understanding, the civilizational understanding. So where Farishta begins with space and time, we end in the 19th and early 20th century in civilization. So I hope I've given you a little bit of a glimpse of the kind of ways in which Farishta is rendered. I haven't said much about Farishta himself or the text itself, I uh, apologize. Uh, but this was really just to give you a sense of how history moved across that time. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions, but before that, I just want to ask you, I haven't read your book, but I'm really looking forward to this, um, The Loss of Hindustan. I believe you have tried to sort of draw connections between how, um, and, and I would love to know in what ways Farishta becomes a major source for the European philosophers. So, I mean, I'm, in particular, I'm interested in, in Voltaire and Hegel. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, as I mentioned, that once Dao renders Farishta into English, that literal translation or rendering is is immediately taken up by Voltaire and by 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 um, um, Hume and by Kant, and Hegel also relies on that same work. Hegel introduces he includes Jonathan Scott's translation as well as. Uh, Alexander Dow's translations, um, but this the the philosophy of history that is being con that's being constructed. What role does India have in in this in this world? That argument is based on or that understanding of their understanding of Farishta through these two texts. 
see. Um, let me take up the question by Ali Haider here. Um, so who is the last Sultan chronologically that is discussed in this book? He's talking about Farishta Tariq. Does modern, uh, do modern editions of Farishta's work also discuss Sultans or Mughal emperors that were not born during his life as he died in 1620 and were born afterwards? Um, yeah, Farishta does not discuss anyone who 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 was born after Farishta died. Um, Farishta's text basically ends with the um, the even before his own time. Really, he, Farishta's text ends with the uh, arrival of Portuguese um, and French uh, in 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 Surat, and so he the the Mughal emperors that he's discussing are in the book, even though he's 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 not. Is, is basically Akbar. Um, and so um, even though he is himself uh, lives on, his, he's treating his work as a work of history, not contemporary reportage. So he, you know, he, he draws the kind of 1590 to 1600 is where the chronology within the book ends, not in Farishtas. As Farishtas, unfortunately, we don't know when he, when he died. We, we, we're, we are guessing somewhere after 1620, but we don't really know. Since you've mentioned the term Ganga Jamni just in my own interest, would love to know what was the, I mean, it's, it's going to be a broad question. You could tell me an instance or so where you feel like we had a very strong regional identity before, of course, the European started to write and the historiography was pretty much taken over. So um, how do you feel like we, so, so what was our identity really, which is, what was the Ganga Jamni aspect? Well, the book um, claims, makes an argument that Hindustan is an identity that was right. shared um, across the subcontinent um, mm. that one can trace as early as the 11th century, but really from the 13th century onwards. Um, and sen 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 something that we see very real in Amir Khusro, we see it very, really, very real in, uh, uh, you know, uh, Farishta. Uh, and then after Farishta, we see um, in the early 17th century, uh, I mean, in the early 18th century, even um, uh, with, in Bandari's Khulasat al-Tawarikh, there is an entire big section on Hindustan. Uh, and we see it all the way through, through, the, um, uh, through the 18th century, um, uh, is that the, the idea of Hindustan as a, as a, as a, both as a uh, space of ethics, a space of pride, pride in kind of being um, born, having the best language, better than Persian, better than Arabic, uh, Sanskrit and, and Hindavi uh, or Hindustani, um, best food, um, best animals, best everything. Uh, this, this is really like something that I think our scholars have not paid attention to in, in the idea that this they, they, there is a commitment to the the world of Hindustan, the commitment to their its languages, its ethos, its practices, its rituals, its beauty. That is um, really kind of cuts across any genre that you might be looking at. So it's in poetry, it's in malfuzat, it's in history, it's in um, you know obviously in kind of built environment. Um, so so so. That project of, of mm. breaking, breaking out this identity of Hindustan and replacing it with first British India and then India, etc., Pakistan, etc., um, is something that I, I, in my book, kind of uh, my argument is that it takes over 200 years to do that. And it, it, that's the project that even in this rendering, you can see how Farishta is broken up into these other, other forms of knowledge. Great. I'm going to take up one more question, and this question is by Mirza Hasnain, and I have Professor Rizavi back on in the meantime. So does this work discuss anything about love story of Malwa Sultan Baz Bahadur and his Hindu wife Rufmati or any other such interesting story? And uh, which kings of Sindh and Multan are discussed in this? 
Um, yes, Farishta is full of really interesting stories, including the Rupmati and, uh, story. Um, unfortunately, my book does not have these stories. So if you're interested in these stories, you will have to read Farishta. Um, my book doesn't actually go into these stories. And the kings of Hind, Sultan, uh, Multan and Sin that are discussed are, are from um, Mahmud uh, Ghaznavi's time all the way to Farishta's time. Uh, can we have the, the next question, please? Yes. Uh, was Farishta biased in writing this book? Did he have affiliation with any Sultanat? Um, yes, absolutely. Farishta was employed by 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 Ibrahim Adil Shah the uh, second, who and who is part of the Nizam Shahi. He's uh, employed as a he was a uh, as a as a diplomat as a palace guard but he's commissioned to write a history um and so this commissioning is is a is a you know is a um, job he's given a job uh, that he has to write this history of hindustan that has to be a new history of hindustan um so the question of bias of course i i get my paycheck from columbia um i don't know if what i write here is biased because Colombia pays for my income. Uh, I think it's a very colonial understanding that Muslim histories are biased be or because they are close to um, a king or a sultan. Um, what I actually try to show in the book is that there is a very explicit and important philosophy of history and ethics of why history should be written included by the, all of these historians that Farishta is, uh, is narrating. And what they say is that you are writing history for the future. You're not writing history for the Sultan that you work for. You're not writing history for the people that you are surrounded by. You're writing history because your predecessors left something incomplete. You're going to complete this. And it's your uh, people who come after you, your descendants, historians. This is a community of historians. They're going to take up your work, fix your mistakes, and move the work forward. So I, I think bias is a wrong kind of framework. Uh, it's a project that's embedded in a philosophy of history that I try to show in the book. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm Lakshmi Kant Mishra introducing the topic you discussed about the concept of provincializing Europe by the page, besides the intellectual traditions of 19th century. In fact, your analysis fits well into the concept of Anthropocene, Anthropocene uh, and calling of history as far as Farishta's rendering of India is concerned. Can you just problematize the renditions against the four theses of Dipesh? Um, th thank you. Um, Dipesh, uh, Dipesh is a teacher of mine. I, I learned much from his work. Um, I think you're right in that there is a, a bit of provincializing uh, that is happening. I think what I'm doing is slightly different. However, I would suggest that it's, it's, it's not simply that Europe's time, history one and history two, um, allows a, a, a kind of a gap in which uh, the native voice can emerge. Um, I think my project of placing Farishta into in the origins of European philosophy of history is is to universalize Farishta, um, even as we think about provincializing Europe. Um, and the other part of this, I think, in terms of the in terms of kind of um, how we think about this space. Uh, I mean, I think that's. Every single study shows that if we look at the South Asia by 2030, there will be about 300 million people who will be displaced due to rising seawater and due to a lowering of the water table. We are right now in a COVID catastrophe. There is no future that we can imagine that is India specific or Pakistan specific or Bangladesh specific. Our waters, our air, our histories, our lives are interconnected. 
And so any politics that is predicated on division and, and segmentation is only going to fail. And so I think what does Farishta or, or historians that I, I'm, I'm talking about in the book from the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, so Sir Shafqat um, Ahmad Khan, Professor Muhammad Habib, um, uh, all of these people that I talk about, historians writing on the medieval period, what they all have in common is not only that they're writing against the colonial state, but they also have in common is their understanding of a common cause against colonialism and against the world that is that is arrayed against us. And I think we need desperately need a new world view that puts the subcontinent, Barazakhir or Hindustan, um, back in a central location from which we can fight the COVID, from which we can fight climate disaster, uh, from which we can uh, live. Uh, right. I mean, so wonderfully uh, said this. Uh, this is. Thank you so much I, for saying that. I'll take up the next question, sir. Nagwan Singh, don't you think legitimization of power was always prevalent in the Indian history and maybe elsewhere too? Indeed, there is no doubt about the variations in their intensity. Is it not right to say that victorious agency always demeaned the defeated, uh, defeated one and later on also collaborated with the native agencies as the Mughal did? So the very idea of epistemicide is only applicable to Western scholarship. Um, if I, I'm, I'm not, thank you so much, uh, Nagwan Singh. I'm, I'm not 100% sure I, I get uh, everything you're saying in this question, but I, I can try and answer it a little bit. Um, I think um, power, political power, obviously has, you know, sides. And um, if, you, if you enter a war, if you go into the battleground, you have a winning and a losing side. One of the interesting things from the project of history writing, however, is that uh, let's say Mahmoud Ghaznavi's um, uh, kind of battles with Rai Jaipal that are described in, by his contemporaries and then read by Farishta. Uh, one of the things that you see in Farishta's rendering of this history is that there is actually no right side and wrong side. Um, and no one actually wins. So you fight, there's a battle, it rages on, people are exhausted, but no one loses it. Now, why is that important? Why is it important to say that a battle happens, everyone is brave, but no one loses? And then there is a some kind of a rapprochement that happens. And I think the reason that I, in the book I write, why Farishta uh, is invested in a particular idea of power, is that power is not simply the power to dominate. The power is also the power to nurture, the power to protect, the power to strengthen. Is also These are also power things. Think about, think about a mother or a father's love or protection for a child. Um, just as much power is invested in that relationship as is it is invested in the relationship of political othering. And, and so what we see is that there is an understanding of political power that is only seen as the power to destroy, to eliminate. And that is indeed a colonial power. And that is indeed a European understanding of, of power on the colony. That understanding doesn't happen in Europe itself. I mean, we can see Machiavelli's prints for how the power to destroy is really restricted for the colony, for the new world. The power to destroy is not for the princes among each other. The princes among each other have to deploy power for the project of um, accumulation, assimilation. We can see this in Hobbes' Leviathan. The Leviathan comes together in order to protect society. Where does the Leviathan not protect society? In the state of nature. Where is the state of nature? In the Americas. So the, our idea of power as only confrontational and existing only in the colony is part of the political philosophy that Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, others have given us as part of this liberal idea of power. And when we think of 
our relationships as through this lens of political uh, domination, I think we're we're not even reading this text that that we you know that are giving us kind of a an account of these contestations properly. And that's something that I try to do in my first book, a book of conquest, as well as in this book, is to 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 elucidate a political theory that's not only about erasure of difference. It's not only about domination and, and defeat. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Sir, there are some more questions. Uh, can we take those up, please? Sure, 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 please. Although I have one question as well, I'd like um, Dr. Manan to elaborate. I understand what you mean by the title of the book, um, The Loss of Hindustan. If you could just elaborate on the choice of this word, loss, you know, and of course, on the invention bit, we get it as well. But if for the sake of our viewers who are you know, not history students or general common people. If you could just elaborate on that, please. <laughs> um, the titles are hard things to elaborate on. That's why the whole book is after the title. Uh, I, I think the loss here is an um, is is um, is there in two ways. I think one is that um, there is something of an idea, uh, some concept of Hindustan that I'm, I'm over the course of the book I show um, is changed. And, and this, is, this change uh, allows for different new concepts to emerge. So India is a new concept. Um, and that emerges out of British India, that emerges out of uh, other, other, uh, other ideas. Um, the loss is also, uh, I think in the book, I, I tag it to the kind of end of the um, um, the kind of aftermath of 1857, um, it's also a kind of a political end, uh, the political end of this idea of Hindustan. Um, that that continues all the way to, you know, uh, Boja's uh, free India army. Um, you know, there's a J, J Hindustan that becomes J Hind. <laughs> and that idea continues, obviously, in Bhagat Singh, and in, it continues um, in the in in all the way to I think the Second World War and so and it obviously exists in 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 concepts like Ganga Jamni to this day, um, but that 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 idea of the loss is is kind of there from Sare Jahan Se Acha Hindustan Hamara, you know, 1905 to I guess where we are now in 2021. I think there is a, uh, yes, uh, the temple plundering uh, of Mahmud of Ghazni has become the image of the Central Asian empires who went to India. But was there a tradition of temple plundering in pre-Islamic India? If yes, could you give some example? Why they are not talked about? Um, yes, it was, it was a very important part of political uh, theory, a very important part of political world. Uh, the Cholas, the Chalukyas, uh, everyone, Raja Raja, Rajendra Raja, um, the, the, the destruction of the, the temple of the ruling elite that you are displacing and the carrying of the Murti back to your capital was an important part of how political power is understood. It's also understood in, if you want to, uh, I can give you a pre-Islamic example, um, St. Augustine's City of God. It begins with the temple destruction of the Roman temple by the Christians. And that's the kind of, uh, you know, the, 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 the destruction of Rome is the destruction of temples. And you can see that the idea of the temple, temple deities, their relationship to political power is incredibly important part of how politics war is governed. Um, so for India specifically, I urge you to uh, read works by uh, professors Richard Eaton, who I think has spoken um, at this very fora in the past. And uh, you can read uh, works by uh, folks like uh, Professor Fan Habib, uh, Romila Thapar, and many others who have written on pre-Islamic um, um, instances of temple destruction? Well, uh, I would just very briefly add to what uh, 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 Manan has just said, that if you go to uh, 
the photo complex itself. Uh, during the process of cleaning the stones at Kutub, what was discovered was that uh, a number of stones which had, you know, Vashta white images on the front, they had, you know, uh, images, Buddhist images and Jain images on the other uh, uh, side of the stone. Uh, Richard Eaton, as Manan just pointed out, uh, elaborates in his work and uh, in his article also, which was widely published. Uh, it was, in fact, uh, also published in the front line. It is easily available. You can Google it. Uh, you will find it. He has tried to show that this was a practice which was a very well-established one. Uh, we should also remember that in the post Gupta period, the uh, you, uh, suddenly the Buddhism and the Buddhist uh, monuments suddenly start disappearing from the Indian subcontinent, and the uh, Buddhist diaspora goes and settle, settles in Central Asia. So much so that that in Central Asia, when there is a rise of these Timurids and others, in fact the Turks also they start thinking that idol uh, is equal to the image of Buddha. Today, in Persian and Urdu traditions, in fact, even in Hindustani and Indian languages, an idol is known as Buddha, which, which is a derivative of the image of Gautam Buddha. So there was something which happened even prior to the coming of Islam. In fact, if you look at the works of Professor D. N. Jha, uh, in one of his works, he points out that the initial attacks, in fact, the real attacks on these universities of Nalanda took place even prior to the coming of the Muslim invasions in the country. Uh, it is not the question of which religion broke what. The fact remains that in the medieval tradition, the image and deity of the conquered was always removed and replaced by the image of the deity of the conquered. It was a well-established tradition, which even the Muslims uh, uh, followed it. Uh, in, in fact, even after the Turkish conquest started in India, uh, there are examples of the breaking of religious structures which were not temples. Alka Patel, whom we are going to have two days later on Sunday, in one of her articles, points out a mosque which is in fact broken and turned into a temple in the region of uh, Rajputan. So this is a tradition uh, which we should not look through the eyes of Hindus or Muslims, it should be looked through the, you know, glasses of a conqueror and the conquered. I must thank uh, uh, Dr. Mannan uh, that uh, uh, he, uh, I mean, uh, at a very, I mean, at our, at our request, he uh, uh, accepted our offer that he should come and give us a talk. Uh, I am sorry, Mannan, that, uh, you know, I had thought that I would be gaining much from your lecture, which surely I will be only after, you know, the video is available and only after I have listened to it in full, because unfortunately, somehow today, uh, uh, as soon as your lecture started, my internet started troubling me. I could hardly follow whatever you had to say except in tidbits. But whatever I could follow, I could gather that, as the topic suggested, that you concentrated not on the theme of Farishta or the contents of Farishta, but you spoke on the various renditions which have been made of the text of Farishta. I would just add one thing without apparently having, uh, I mean, I was sitting along with your book and I was interested that I would be, I mean, uh, 
trying to enter into some thought, uh, sort of a dialogue. But unfortunately, at the moment, I won't be doing that. But, uh, you know, there is one thing which, uh, you know, I want, just wanted to ask. You started uh, telling us about the various renditions. How Parishta was interpreted, translated, understood at various points of time by various historians of the modern period. You named a number of them. Hmm. Uh, would it be incorrect to say that if you want to complete that list of various types of interpretations in order to understand Parishta, your name should also be added to that because I find that your take on Farishta is very different from the takes of Farishta by the earlier authorities. So I would recommend, I mean, it's not a question, I'm just pointing out to the audience that, uh, you know, when uh, uh, Mannan talks about Briggs, Mannan talks about the other historians uh, who uh, took up the task of, uh, you know, uh, 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 reading Farishta, uh, do read what Manan has to say. In fact, the question which Shagufta asked, loss of Hindustan, is also related with how one understands Parishta in the modern context. I would say that, you know, in the account of Parishta, which is very relevant for the entire period of medieval India, I mean, as a historian at Aligarh Manan, uh, I am told that uh, when we are dealing with a particular topic or a particular epoch or decade, we should only refer to those sources which are primary to that period. So if we are dealing with Sultanate, we only refer to those uh, sources, for example, about Muhammad bin Tughlaq. So we would only uh, deal with sources which are contemporary to Muhammad bin Tughlaq. All other uh, things are secondary. Similarly, if one is dealing with the reign of Akbar, I mean, uh, at Aligarh we had scholars like uh, M. Athar Ali and uh, Ikhtada Alam Khan uh, who, who, who were teaching me Akbar and Aurangzeb and Jahangir uh, and Shah Jahan, all these people. And whenever we would ask any question regarding a source, he would just brush it off. No, this source is not contemporary to that period. I'm not going to believe it, but it was only and it is only and only Farishta who is quoted for all the periods, whether it is the period of Muhammad bin Tughlaq, whether it is a point of elaboration as far as uh, the reign of Humayun is concerned or the reign of uh, Akbar is concerned. We always uh, treat Farishta as a primary source that establishes the importance of the account of Farishta. Secondly, sir, as you have rightly pointed out in your work, that the type of Hindustan which is presented by Farishta is now somehow lost. If during the period when accounts like Farishta were being written, the invasions from the Northwest were being referred to as the invasions of the Turushkas. Today, our NCRT books and other textbooks which are taught in the school, we are told that it was the Muslim invasions which took place. For example, the type of history which was presented to us by the renditions of Eliot and Dawson totally changed what had been established by historians like Parishta. I mean, your account, I mean, the loss of innocence of Hindustan, uh, looking at Hindustan, not through its own eyes, but through European glasses, is something which uh, one can say Hindustan versus India. And I think that is one of your greatest contributions by writing this book, you have in fact pinpointed where we should look for as far as our past is concerned. I think 
your book on Farishta is although one amongst the many on Farishta, but at the moment for present age, all these students who are now students of history, especially those of medieval India, I would once again recommend that this book, The Loss of Hindustan, should be a must read for them. Uh, we should also remember that uh, people like Mannan are now very scarce as far as the field of medieval India is concerned. Most of the modern scholars, I won't name them, there are many great names who may be conversant in Portuguese and Dutch and this and that, but they lack the knowledge of the primary language in which the sources are written for the medieval period question. In order to understand those nuances and bring out that history, we need historians like Mannan, and I am really thankful to him that today he spoke uh, to us on a topic which must interest these students. I wish that we would have invited him to discuss his book, The Loss of Hindustan. That would have been much better. But when I discussed uh, with Bannan that we are going, we, we want you uh, to talk to us, uh, he gave us this topic. And I thought that this is a topic which is also very, very relevant, uh, which is something which all these students should know. And that is why I did not argue with him. Uh, but uh, now, before the public, I would like to request Mannan that in future, at some future time, uh, although your book has been discussed a lot, but I would once again ask you if in one of our future programs, you could actually discuss uh, the book Loss of Hindustan, just like we had Richard Eaton, who discussed his book on the uh, Persian Empire, and we had Manakia discussing a book. So it would be a great idea if we can have you interpreting your book. Uh, we, I, I have read a number of reviews of your books by various you know, scholars, all having a different take. I would be interested to know what your take on your book is. So I think uh, with those words, uh, I'm, I'm really very, very, very sorry that I could not actually hear what you talked about. Uh, uh, but uh, I promise you that today night itself, uh, if I am able to download uh, this video, I'll surely, surely uh, uh, see it today itself. Once again, thank you very much. And to the audience, uh, please join us uh, on uh, Sunday as well because we have uh, another uh, 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 scholar lined up uh, from the US itself. And she's a scholar of, once again, a great repute, who is working on uh, certain monuments of the Sultanate and early mid medieval period, Dr. Alka Patel. And uh, I know uh, that uh, these days, almost every house at least in North India and in Maharashtra and in certain other states have had one tragedy or the other. Uh, but I think uh, we should be positive and we should keep on engaging ourselves in these mental exercises instead of just lamenting. Uh, thank you very much and hope to meet all of you on Sunday at 8 o'clock as usual. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for